Well, in much wisdom is much grief, and in knowledge there's sorrow, sorrow and there's there's pain in the hearts. You know, what was that scripture in Jeremiah? Was it Jeremiah? Alas, I see pain on every face. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be delivered out of it. So, we make the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. So we kind of resign ourselves to the pain, as we were kind of casually talking here. Even Paul said, I was, we were oppressed above measure in Asia, so that we despaired of our lives. Huh? That's, isn't that something? The Apostle Paul wishes he wasn't even alive. You know, so there's things that are really going to challenge us and our hope and everything else. Um, and I'm going to talk about the embrace of wounds somewhere in this tonight. The embrace of wounds, and I'm just going to, you know, bring out of my old storehouse. When I was wondering about whether I should just preach this, oh, I've preached this before. This is, you know, this is kind of like my trademark to preach on bitterness and resentment and forgiveness. And because I've done a lot of that and I've experienced a lot of it. Well, I just uh, was browsing through some of my old preaching notes and uh, inadvertently opened one that talked about uh, weeding the gardens. <laughs> there was not a man to till the ground, so there's a man who has to till the ground. That's part of what's accomplished through preaching sometimes. They're kind of tilling the ground, digging things up, pulling out weeds. Well, you know, weeds are weeds, right? The same weeds you pulled out last week. You know, two weeks later, you may be pulling out some more weeds, and they're the same weeds. Right, so we give the same counsel because we just get renew the washing of the water of the word, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we all go through pain and uh, hope, hope, uh, challenge, challenged hope. And I was considering how it's not really wrong to be to desire to be vindicated. Especially if you have witnessed that there are some things you've done in Christ or in the righteousness of God. And we have the souls that were underneath the altar. Remember that? Mm -hmm. They said, how long, O Lord, how long before you avenge us? So that's not in, it, in and of itself really wrong. What would be wrong is this, is would be if... In a bitter state, we try to vindicate ourselves, right? That, that's what the, the issue would be. Likewise, as we've talked over the years about honor, you know, some people think that, uh, well, you know, we're exhorted to be humble people, people of humility, you know, not to seek vainglory, and so on and so forth. And yet, you know, concerning prophets and men of God, a prophet's not without Honor and then that labor in the word, count them double honor and so on. God has given to us the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery he, which he before ordained unto our glory. The men of God are somewhat magnified and glorified as they express the purpose of God and bring revelation. And to those who seek after honor and immortality, the book of Romans says somewhere, something like that, right? So we are seeking honor. There's no question about it. You have to be honored. You have to be accepted. It's fundamental to give your heart purpose and meaning and, and unity and fellowship. You know, I have to honor you. I have to accept you. I have to receive you. You go down to the store and you have a, a coupon, right? I go down to Bilo and I have a coupon for Piggly Wiggly. Well, sometimes the... Uh, the buy low store might say, well, we honor our competitors' coupons. Mm -hmm. Well, what are they saying? We accept them. We, we, we count it as legitimate. We receive it. We accept it. So accepting one another is honoring one another. So in and of itself, seeking honor isn't wrong. But, you know, the scripture I always quote in John chapter 6, I believe, or 5 or 6, is when Jesus says, how can you believe ye that seek honor one from another and seek not the honor that comes from God? There can be an exercise in seeking honor where the exercise is misdirected. It's seeking honor of men. And yet, amongst us as the people of God, members of the body of Christ, uh, I can receive honor from you and you can receive honor from me. And it's not really the honor of men, is it? Because it's Christ in us. 
So there's a distinction there. So I'm not discounting the idea of the communication of, of faith and acceptance and honor one to another. You can't say that that shouldn't happen. You shouldn't cower under a false sense of humility like we're not allowed to honor each other because that's vainglory. Well, it's not always vainglory. We got to receive one another. Honor, we have to acknowledge the good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus. That's what um, Philemon said. He said that the communication, the sharing, the expression of your faith, the communication of your faith may be effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. So, well, if you didn't believe there was a teaching gift in me from Christ Jesus, my, I, and I would communicate it to you, my communicating, my sharing it to anybody would be completely of no effect if you didn't acknowledge and give some kind of acceptance and honor to the working of a gift and the spirit that's operating through me that God gave. We just got to remember it's God who gave it to us. And then I just remember uh, when I was in Pembroke and, and I was with Brother Glenn and I was just starting to get into the role, the swing of my my calling. And Glenn was beginning to give me a little more liberty and exercise to, to teach and uh, I was feeling pretty good about it. And uh, one day the anointing of God fell on Glenn in the kitchen and it's one of those rare few times that that, you know, I saw something kind of physical in the physical realm where the whole room turned like into a white luminous cloud and it was so it was the glory of God and it was it was so it was so it so filled the room that it from from my perspective from my eyes the contents of the room disappeared and all I saw was Glenn's face with this glorious luminous white cloud of glory and I knew God was anointing him to prophesy at me, and he just rebuked me. And I don't remember everything, but it was, it was, uh, it was along the lines of, uh, yeah, you, you're teaching, but you're not doing the teaching. I'm doing the teaching. The, the teaching is a gift that I've given you. You know, you. <laughs> why do you? Why do you glory as though you're doing the teaching when you're not doing the teaching? I'm doing. <laughs> you see, it was just kind of like really rebuking me and laying me low because I was beginning to get puffed up and uh, sort of all wrapped up in all this stuff that I was thought I was doing as a teacher. Well, you know how Jesus dealt with his disciples, right? Lord, you know, the devils are subject to us through thy name. They were calling attention and kind of delighting and, and uh, obsessing over the fact that of what God was doing through them. The devils are subject to us through thy name. And you know the response to Jesus. I beheld Satan fall as lightning. And so we, we, we got to have that balance, right? I mean, you can see how I, Paul said to Timothy, you know, about putting people into the ministry and preaching and stuff. You don't, don't put a novice in there because God, if God begins to use him for the sake of those who are sitting by and, and anoint him and he gets lifted up with pride and then falls in the condemnation of the devil. Well, when we get lifted up in pride, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Well, this is just an experience I had uh, quite a while ago, probably 25 years ago, as God was dealing with, with me on those issues. But anyway, it's not wrong to seek honor. It's not wrong to seek after honor. It's the honor that comes from God. And a portion of that honor that comes from God can come from one, one member of the body of Christ to another. Just because it comes from one member of the body of Christ to another doesn't necessarily mean it's the honor of man, right? Right? And uh, even, even so, you know, like, the, we, we shouldn't receive anything from men, right? Receive nothing from men. And Paul was big on that point. We receive nothing from men. But what, what about, we're not men. See, we're not men. We're brothers. We're fellow ministers. We're, we're, we're co-workers with the Spirit of God operating through us. You know, what, what, what world ruler or what president or what uh, person seated in a place of authority, what person does not have certain other people that he goes to for guidance, advice, you got any ideas? Because he wants to take the whole thing into account. And we know that 
Even with Paul, a dispensation of the gospel was committed unto him. And probably the biggest portion of the gospel was dispensed to him. Dispensation. But like anything that's dispensed, you go to a candy machine, it's a dispenser. You know, you, you don't you don't put money in there and you don't get everything in the candy machine out in one in one sitting. It is distributed. The, bo- the body of Christ is distributed. It's dispensed. One is given a certain dispensation to another, a different dispensation. One body, many members, differences of administrations. Uh, God puts uh, rich and poor and, and He distributes all this, these things, gifts of the Holy Ghost, severally as He will. But He distributes it. He doesn't give it all in one place because He has to make sure there will be no schism, no division in the body. Of course, to whomsoever much is given, much is required, right? Yeah. And, to whom, and if it's not much is given to you, well then, not much is required. Here I'll give you uh, five talents. Uh, how did you do? Well, my five gained five. I'll give you two talents. My two gained two. Well, both of them had a hundred percent increase, <laughs> right? So we're not really trying to, but really we're not trying to compare ourselves amongst ourselves. You know, we're not trying to say, uh, well, my ministry has accomplished us and so, how about yours? Your, your, yours hasn't done that, therefore you must not be of God. Well, I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't play, I wouldn't think like that, right? So, honor is all right, the seeking of honor, but it has to be the honor that comes from God. I'm going to try to find that scripture. All right. Okay, it's Romans chapter 2 about judging. Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Remember we talked about judgment, and the distinction we made with Romans chapter 2 is that you are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind. And that's Romans chapter 2, is you in a carnal mind. You know, if your brothers be taken in a fault, ye which are carnal, restore, no, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. So there is judgment in the church. There is the calling out of things. There is the um, uh, correction of false doctrines and false ideas and false pre- precepts, the establishing of righteous foundations uh, <coughs> and all of that. It's just that we can't do it ourselves. You know, you judge for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. It has to be an exercise that we've perfected where we communicate with the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ works through the body of Christ to bring forth righteous judgment. But not uh, not the condem- condemning judgment, I'll say, it, briefly, I'll say it like that. But anyway, in, in uh, Romans chapter 2, uh, after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his yeah, deeds or works. That, that's important because God does care what happens in our flesh. He doesn't poo-poo away anything that happens in our flesh. The body is for the Lord not for fornication, it is to express the image of Jesus Christ. We are to yield our members as the servants of righteousness. Don't yield your members servants of unrighteousness. And, uh, and we, we've gone through that so many times. So he will render to every man according to his deeds, put off the old man and his deeds. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive for the things that what? We believed in our minds and our spirits? No, for the things that we did in our Body. bodies. Good or evil. That was your bottom line. That's your bottom line right there. To them, here it is though, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, God will give you eternal life. But uh, to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, which is manifested by the deeds of your flesh. Okay? But obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no 
respect of persons with God. So, that's a very important issue in everybody's heart, is acceptance, which you could also say is the receiving of honor. Okay, and the want of honor is the destruction of the prince. Somewhere we have to have honor, and we have to be able to distinguish the difference between the honor that comes from men and the honor that comes from God. And even amongst ourselves, you know, if, if I'm in a carnal spirit, I can try to bestow honor upon someone and maybe it's, it's not uh, the honor of God. Maybe it's a flattery. Now, I don't want to confuse you all, but I'm just saying, here's all the potential that exists. We're in, we're in flesh. We're at various degrees of perfection, but we have Christ in us. And we're supposed to give honor one to another, right? Give honor unto the weaker vessel, for instance. The comely parts, the parts that are, that are a great demonstration of the Holy Ghost through them all the time, and they're always prophesying and they're preaching and they're always demonstrating the Spirit. And they, they got a big profile and they got lots of acceptance and honor. And everybody's talking about this great man of God and that great man of God. They, those, those are the comely parts, right? They're getting their honor. You know, they're getting their accolades and compliments and acknowledgments from the saints as they... But our uncomely, our ugly parts, if you want to call them ugly, or you want... They're, they're not as... Yeah, they're not as seemingly honorable on the outside. Maybe they're simpler folks. Maybe they don't have lots of revelation. Maybe they're just simple. Maybe they just have simple faith. Maybe they're just people that God put it in their heart that they're always going to show mercy. Or they're always going to be very gracious, right? Or maybe they're suckers, encouragers of people. Or whatever. But they have a lower profile. Upon those, we bestow the more abundant honor. And that, again, that whole, that whole part of the scripture is, ex, is expounding how God, why God is doing that so that there's no division in the body. There's no schism. We're all supposed to have the same care one for another. And that's what, what I was talking about when Glenn uh, re- rebuked me sort of in the name of the Lord in the first person. The Lord was rebuking me. Now what do you have that you haven't received? And why do you glory as though you have not received it? And you think you're better than someone else. Uh, you know, like, like I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm a te- great teacher full of knowledge and understanding, and you're all, what's wrong with you dough heads? What's wrong with you? Well, the <laughs> Bible says, no, don't think like that, because what do you have that you haven't received? And why should anybody glory as though they haven't received it, as though it's something they've come up with themselves? So it's, it's a real thing. It's okay to seek after honor. But we want the honor that comes from God. How can you believe, ye that seek honor one from another, and seek not the honor that comes from God? And the trap of honor, the trap of seeking honor, is that if you get desperate for honor, and you try to receive the honor from men, you try to maintain a good... uh, reputation in the eyes of men and that becomes your concern and you're trying to get your honor from uh, you know ungodly sources or just from people the reason that the devil had no stronghold or no access or any kind of influence upon Jesus Christ when he was on the earth and remember what he said the devil hath come and he's got nothing in me he hasn't got a thing in me He can't tempt me. He can't do anything. He has got nothing in me. Why? Because Jesus' soul was secured in the honor that he had from his Father. And we must become secure in the honor that we have from Jesus Christ, whether it's Jesus Christ visiting you personally, or whether it's the honor that we confirm one another as we accept and receive and minister to one another, and receive one another, and honor one another legitimately in Christ, we become content and we become complete in that. You are complete in Him. And then you cannot be tempted because you don't have any need. You don't need any honor from without. 
That's the fire. You know, there's a the proverb says there's a fire that never says it's it's enough. And always, you know, the horse leech has what are four dollars going? Give, 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 give me more, give me more, give me more drugs, give me more sex, give me more women. It's never enough because, you know, the uh, we were talking last week about Elvis Presley and how all the fans adoring him was never enough. He was looking for honor from without, but it never did the job. The poor monger is always looking for more honor from women. Another woman honor me. Another one. That is a symptom of somebody who is incomplete in their hearts and they are seeking honor from without. And the reason that the devil can have no place in you is, or me is when we have that root in ourselves. When we are secure and complete in him, we know we have the honor that comes from God. But of course, if we have the honor that comes from God, it's going to come through the fellowship of His sufferings. Disallowed of men, but chosen of God. See, rejected by the world, rejected by men, but chosen of God. Elect, precious God will visit you and confirm you and you'll have honor that comes from God. Those who by patient continuance, we've got to continue in this and we've got to have patience and we will eventually be established in the honor that comes from God. So what, what sends us on the quest of trying to receive Honor from men. It's it's basically our bitterness and our wounds and our you know our bitter rejection and that sort of thing. When I was preaching last week, uh, and I've been preaching a little bit lately on the uh, wounds and healing vision that I had been talking about. Lo- many of God's people in the vision were they were sitting in the pews and and they had wounds, but it was not apparent because. Scar tissue had grown over the wounds. They were hidden wounds. Hidden wounds. So there are wounds that are in the heart, hearts of God's people that go back to experiences that are in the past where the wounds were never properly healed. And then scar tissue grows over and underneath the wounds are festering. In the plague of leprosy, uh, it describes a condition. Of course, leprosy is sin, and the basis of sin is the gall of bitterness. And and uh, in that in Leviticus thirteen and fourteen and fifteen, in the law of the leopard, in the plague of leprosy, the plague of leprosy can fret inward, and that's where it turns into the root of bitterness. So, getting back to the fundamentals of being free or getting back to the foundation of iniquity as you know we have the story in acts chapter 8 of simon the sorcerer and we know that he saw that through the laying on of the apostles hands the holy ghost was given and before the apostles came around he was giving out that he himself was a great one and he was bewitching the people with sorcery so when he saw that by the laying on the uh, laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he said, "Well, I'll give you money that whoever I lay my hands, they may receive the Holy Ghost." Because he followed the apostles and he he said he believed, beholding the signs and the wonders that were done. You know, because that was kind of like his bag. He was bewitching the people with wonders and things. Because we know what Peter said. He said, "Your your money perish with you." Because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You know, your heart is not right with God, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. So from that story, from that scripture, we correlate the gall of bitterness with the bond of iniquity. Well, what is the bond? The bond is something that makes two things stick together. Right? Like glue. You bond two things together. Can two walk together? Or can two be bonded in a together except they agree you have to be bonded to your sin somewhere you your heart has to make an agreement with sin 
and be bonded together with it. There has to be a, an agreement in the heart to bond you to sin. And that agreement that sin makes with you is based on the gall of bitterness, the wounds of rejection. If I'm embittered, if I've been betrayed, if someone has done me some injustice or I think someone has done me an injustice, that leaves my heart in a bitter state, a state of rejection, a state of being wounded. From that condition of heart, sin or Satan can come in and say, Hey, you've been wounded. You deserve some comfort. Why don't you go down there and buy a gallon of ice cream? Or why don't you go pick up that girl over there and take her home and have a good time? You'll feel so much better. You'll be comforted. Right? So your whole pursuit of comfort is based on your feelings of bitterness and rejection and the pain and the wound that's in your soul. And that's what gets you to agree with Satan to pursue after a false comfort. Likewise, it'll get you to agree with Satan to pursue after vengeance, self-vengeance. Or self-justification. So, in order for us not to have that motivation to try to pursue after all of these things ourselves, like I say, remember, go back to what I said earlier. It's not wrong to want to be vindicated. But, if it's coming out of my own gall of bitterness, someone slanders me and I just think, I've got to make that guy see what he said is wrong, and then I go... Knocking down his door and, <laughs> you know, and doing all kinds of things. Well, that could just be my own effort. And yet God is going to vindicate his righteousness wherever it is. But it's going to take something. But it's going to have to take some patience, right? Souls underneath the altar. Lord, how long before you vindicate what we did, you know? How long before you vindicate us against all the slurs and the slanders of people who have accused us of being evil when we were just righteously standing on the holiness of God and doing what God told us? Can you imagine if it was Balaam's ass? Balaam's ass would probably have that cry in his heart, huh? Lord, how long before you vindicate me that that old... Uh, Balaam, the prophet, in his perverse way, he was beating me, and all I was trying to do was, was keep him out of trouble. <laughs> and he's just accusing me of being a rebel. Yeah. How long, Lord, before you vindicate? Well, that's a hard thing to wait, wait on God for. Right? But So it's not wrong to want to be vindicated. But... Any attempts to be vindicated that are our own efforts or that are born out of bitterness are destined to fail. So, now, that means that as individuals, our best strategy is to make sure that we're maintained and we seek after healing. That's why it's important for us to be healed from those wounds. And that's why... Uh, Uh, forgiveness becomes a key to deliverance. Because if someone did, in fact, s slander us or wound us or do some injustice against us, then our escape from pain and bitterness is to forgive, right? It has to, there has to be forgiveness, even if the other party doesn't acknowledge the truth in the issue. Forgiveness becomes a key, right? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. With the same measure. Yeah, but now it's still not wrong to want to be vindicated. Right. <laughs> okay, and, and like the Bible says, God is plenteous in mercy. Well, you know... If your brother sin against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive, forgive him. <laughs> well, some people need to repent so we, we can forgive you. <laughs> and maybe some of that's vice versa too. Who knows? But I, what I'm saying is, God is plenteous in mercy, ready to forgive. You think God's forgiveness hasn't already been paid for every man, woman, and child that has ever existed? Jesus Christ died, what, just for the sins of the saved? 
No, he died for the sin of the whole world. But that that price he paid has no effect on on many people. No effect. So it has to be sin has to be acknowledged, repented of. There, there's there's a criteria for forgiveness. Believe it or not, there's criteria for forgiveness, and it all boils down to when we realize that our sin and our bitterness is because we're just so damn sore. I was talking last week of how, uh, especially amongst the ministry, the ministry who is called to reprove and rebuke, we have to be careful that we don't use a ministering position as a platform just to air our grievances against people. Right? Then, uh, then that's no good. All I'm doing is I'm exploiting my gift and my calling uh, to complain and uh, I'm still in my gall of bitterness. And that there's a sore. See, this sore stuff has to be dealt with. We're sore. Some of the, uh, some of God's people were wounded, but they were, they weren't getting healed because they were consumed with their wounds. They were embracing their wounds. Okay, so we don't want to embrace our wounds. We do not want to have like an affinity, a preference, and favor our wounds. You know how you can favor a wound? You can show affection for a wound. Because it draws attention. Well, sometimes when you see little kids who get wounded, maybe they'll limp around and maybe they don't have to limp anymore because their leg could be getting healed or what, what have you. But, but they ham it up and they really put on a big show like they're favoring their wound because it's drawing lots of attention. It's getting them honor. All right, so that's the way we are as people sometimes. We favor our wounds. We embrace them because it makes us feel like we've got the right to... Go after an ungodly comfort or, or suck hole all the false honor from men to try to assuage our pain or what have you. Well, I've talked about this recently too. And it's not wrong to want to be comforted, right? Well, and we need to be comforted. But we have to, we can't embrace our wounds to the point where we hang on to them so that we maintain our own sense of, I have a right to be angry because look what happened to me last year when such and such happened. Therefore, I have a right to hold this grudge or I have a right to take vengeance or you know, I have a right to comfort myself with this or that. Uh, the story of blind Bartimaeus was he was a beggar and that uh, as the story goes, he had a garment on, and the garment was something that the government gave you, which gave you a legal right to be a beggar. You had to be authorized to stand and be a beggar. When Jesus comes around, the Bible says about blind Bartimaeus, he casting away his garment. Have I got the right story? Was it blind Bartimaeus? Anyway, yeah. he casting away his garment. You know, they said, hey, the master was, wants, to, wants to see you. Well, he ca once Jesus comes around, he cast away his garment, which gave him the right to be a beggar. Mm -hmm. You know, and the Bible tells us, turn away from the beggarly elements. We're not supposed to be beggars for honor. Right? We're not supposed to be beggars. Because that is almost like dog natures. Dog dogs are the ones that go around begging you to pet them, begging you to pet them. You know, and, and I got to say, I like dogs. And I like cats, and I like giving attention to dogs and petting dogs uh, as much as anyone else may want to do it. But the reality is, if the dog comes to me and I don't pet him, the dog will go to somebody else until somebody else pets him. That's the dog nature. Does he really care that much about you? I don't think so. You may, we may think he does, and you know, dogs may become attached to certain individuals to a certain extent. But you know how, how dogs are. One time I was thinking about human compassion, so I had a little an indictment for human compassion. What is human compassion? And human compassion is something where we would be slightly healed, not fully healed, slightly healed. Human compassion is when one gall of bitterness relates to somebody else's gall of bitterness. Yeah. And they have fellowship and consol temporary consolation in their bitterness. Right, so it'd be like my wife cheats on me, and I'm bitter, and your wife cheated on you, and I say, "Yeah, that old hoe, she cheated on me." <laughs> yeah, well, mine did too. I say, "Oh," and then, then 
all of a sudden we've become buddies because we can relate to one another because your wife cheated on you and my wife cheated on me and we can sit there and uh and uh justify drinking a bunch of beers to drown our sorrows and our uh you know try to heal our wounds of how try to forget how much we hurt because our wives cheated and and we can have fellowship in our bitterness yeah yeah, all women, they're just, they're just nothing but a bunch of hoes, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. That's all they are. That's all they are. They only want one thing. And so women could say that about a man. But it's one gall of bitterness relating to another gall of bitterness and trying to console each other in it, but there's no healing. Yeah. All you're doing is revisiting the wound, rehearsing the sore, and reinforcing the sore. Okay, now that brings me to the next issue. When you're talking about forgiveness, uh, and I always try to include the word resentment in there, because we know what resentment is, you know, it's ill feelings about things that have happened to you in the past. If you remember last week reading about the uh, wounded sheep vision, uh, one of the strategies of Satan was to get the sheep to recall to their remembrance former wounds, and then get all wrapped up in it, and get consumed in it. You get so consumed in it that they're not able to open their heart to healing. King David said in Psalm 77, The day of my trouble I sought the Lord, my sore ran in the night. When you are sore, when you are wounded, the sore oozes, it runs. Remember we talked about Isaiah chapter 1? Wounds, bruises, putrefying sores. You think of Job, when Job had sores, it had... They had a running issue, pus and stuff coming out. When you have a sore, your sore runs. When you are sore, you want to be comforted. And that issue, spiritual issue of I want to be comforted or I want to be vindicated or I want to be understood. I want someone to understand what happened to me. Uh, that That is an issue that pours out of you. It's, it's running, it's running. It's, it's issuing out, it's issuing out. It's looking for anything. It's desperate, it's desperate. Anybody, you know, anybody, console me. You know, give me a comfort. Do, say something. It's desperate. It, it, it's looking for anything it can construe as comfort. It's a sore that ran. You had a woman, she had an issue of blood. It, it was running, it was running. It was the life coming out of her. Slowly just... Uh, Coming out of her, coming out of her. The cry for comfort. Like I said, the desire to want to be comforted is not wrong of itself, but, well, let's, as we said the, uh, last week or the week before, how about Sodom and Gomorrah? They weren't righteous folks. They sure had a cry, but it wasn't being dealt with righteously, was it? So anyway, uh, my sore, okay, David says, I, re my sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused. My soul refused to be comforted. We may, we may have episodes like that. Paul, we were talking earlier. Paul said, my, my, I was despaired of life. I bet you for a little season of time and Paul was pressed out of measure in Asia and he despaired that he was even alive. I bet you there was a his sore was running, and there was a season there where it, you, probably nobody could comfort him. But I'm saying that's not a good position to be in. Yeah. Because you have to be able to be comforted. If you can't be comforted by God, by godly comforts, then you will be subject to emanate out of your spirit and look after every other false comfort there is. Yeah. And, and so we have to remember, Jesus said, I'll never, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Jesus will never leave you. He said, I'll I won't leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Remember last week, Ezekiel 34, the pastors and the men of God were feeding themselves. The, the flock was scattered. They became meat and prey to every beast in the field. They wandered around. They were eating spiritual junk food. They were falling by the way. They were getting all messed up in trouble, backsliding, everything else, because they've been driven away. And Jesus said, I, even I, will both search and seek out my sheep. This is such a mess that I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to go search and seek them out myself. So I will come to you. I will not leave you comfortless. 
That's why we exhort another one another daily while it's called today. We we have to keep this up here and maintain ourselves so that we don't fall prey to all of that other stuff. So human compassion is the slight healing. It's just we can all relate to each other and and, and uh, relate and correlate to one another on uh, hey, you went through the same better thing that I went through. Yeah, I mean, wasn't he a, he wasn't here a turd to do that? Yeah, he really was a and then we can get a temporary false consolation that we can relate to each other. But what are we doing? We're rehearsing the issue. And this, again, okay, I'm bringing it back to the word resent. Because the strategy of Satan in the vision of the wounded sheep is, uh, is that my sheep were recalling to their remembrance former experiences where they were wounded. So this is something where we cannot, we have to be aware of resentment resentment literally means to relive to relive so if i'm reliving an event in my mind you know something happened to me it was a bitter thing and uh, it was a distasteful disagreeable woundful hurtful experience that left just a sour taste in my soul made me wounded rejected alienated, lonely, in need of want of comfort and everything else. I do not want to rehearse and relive that thing over and over again. Because it's like I was saying before, you know, you beat your brother with 40 stripes. If you go more than that, you're just rehearsing your grievance with your brother until you lose the ability to think anything of him other than evil because of the exercise of reinforcing the remembrance of evil only about your brother and it's the same thing with resentment when you remember and you call to remembrance and then you relive all the emotions uh you're just reinforcing the wound you're strengthening the bond and the root of that wound inside of you well and i want to make a distinction there too about casting your care upon him you, you can try to cast your care about a situation upon a brother or cast your care upon the Lord. All, all right. And you can do that in a way so that you get that, uh, you, re, you release that feeling of bitterness and you cast it on the Lord and let him take it. So you will rehearse it with him once and you will leave it with him as a high priest. But when you do that, when you, there's always the danger of rehearsing the sore and then feeling bad about it again. So there is such a thing as taking your sores and your wounds and the things that trouble you and you cast it upon the Lord. And that's a legitimate exercise. And in that there is somewhat of a remembrance of what happened to you, right? But you're casting it upon the Lord so you can exercise it out of your spirit. The way you know that is it is being becoming a bitter thing is if it, it if it gets you all agitated and bitter again. See, if, if you're casting your care upon the Lord, there should be a release of a burden. Yeah. There should be a witness from the Lord. There should be a cleansing work going on, a renewing in your mind, a lifting, an easing of the burden, a peace that follows. Uh, and then you're no longer occupied in thinking about that thing anymore. But... If we want to uh, rehearse our, we can also, you know, rehearse our sore one with another to the point where we're just reinforcing it. Now, this is where, when I first came to South Carolina and started preaching on bitterness and everything, uh, we talked about psychology and psychiatry, the way that men try to deal with people and their problems and their sores and their wounds and the issues of their soul. Of course, psychology, psyche, the Greek word for soul, and ology is the study of, the study of the soul. Well, man doesn't know, man doesn't know the soul of a man. Yeah. So psychology can only, does not, you, you cannot be healed by psychologists, deep, deep the way God wants you to be healed. But, um, Well, you, you consider how you say, oh, I went to the shrink, you know, and you, you have the stereotypical image of somebody laying down on a couch and you have the psychologist sitting on the chair with his notepad and his pen and uh, you have the guy say, well, well, doc, you know, it all started long ago when I was a little kid and my dad always used to call me names and 
and he's trying to rehearse all his problems with the psychiatrist or the psychologist. But by and large, uh, for the most part, that exercise of psychology had just become an issue of people reinforcing their own uh, source, just reinforcing them. I wanted to read a few things uh, with, with regard to that and certain statistics. And well, what it ends up doing for most people is it makes them feel uh, <coughs> justified in embracing their wounds because they're rehearsing them. They're not releasing them. They're rehearsing them. They're strengthening them. Okay, that's, uh, that's slightly healed or even, even worse than that, reinforcing the gall of bitterness. And somebody was, I uh, have to go back and find out who these people were who were making these comments about psychology and so forth. But there are even some people in the profession who have recognized that psychology has a pernicious effect on individuals and society. And it, it's, psychiatry and psychology often help people to reinforce the notion in themselves to consider, cast themselves as victims. Okay, If I'm the victim, then it's not my fault, it's your fault, right? Yeah. If I am the victim, I need to be vindicated, I need to be compensated. And that's the kind of, of, of people we've cultivated in America. People who have a right. People who feel like they've been victimized. Therefore, people who feel like they're entitled. And then they become unthankful. Because they just think that they're entitled. And that's what we got to... We can't really cultivate the sense that, that we are victims. We have to try to escape that. Okay, the theories of psychology industry exist as totems which reduce people to whining, weak, passive, and vulnerable children that are more intent on nurturing their inner child and wounds than, uh, than rather than on strengthening their resolve as adults to overcome all these things. Right? See where I'm getting at? And uh, there was a study where men and women received psychological treatment after claiming to have recovered repressed memories. A while back, there was a big movement in psychology called recovered memory therapy, where they would try to get people to recover the memory of deeply hidden traumas in their childhood. Problem is, is that a lot of these things were fabricated. You couldn't, they, they were, they were, they may have just been imaginations in the minds of the people and they didn't actually happen. But yet they hypnotize them and they use all these psychological techniques to get people to try to recover the memory of things that happened to them in the past as a means, as a therapeutic, as a means of therapy to help them to recover. But men and women who receive this kind of treatment, and basically this is based on sexual abuse, 10% of these showed suicidal tendencies before treatment and 67% showed suicidal tendency afterwards. <laughs> So you see, all it did is it made it worse. Yeah. Now, I'm not uh, being insensitive against real sexual abuse here. And, and, and you can take that out of... Con uh, just Because these are my older notes, but it doesn't have to be sexual abuse. It just has to be something perceived as trauma. Okay, and uh, see, I'm remembering now. It was this woman who was a psychiatrist. She left the profession... And she wrote a book about the, the, the psychology and psychiatric industry or the, the field. And the book was called Manufacturing Victims. And she observed that most of the approach of psychology was just making people into more, feeling more victimized, less functional, uh, nurturing their own dysfunctionality and immaturity and embrace of wounds to the point where they could never overcome. They get more and more dysfunctional. They get worse and worse. They get more suicidal. This is what I'm emphasizing is, is we don't want an exercise, a practice of reliving, reliving past traumas to the extent where we're reinforcing it. We, we are cultivating and strengthening our feeling like we have a right to want vengeance. We have a right to to go after comfort. We have a right to 
See, because that's the bonds to iniquity. That bitterness is the bond to iniquity. We got to get healed of that stuff. Now, we can't just slightly heal it and gloss it over with a bunch of scar tissue and it's still down there. But we do have to deal with it. And the key to dealing with it is, I'm not really a victim. <laughs> because this is all God's doing. Right? Remember the thief on the right? Yeah. We This man has done nothing, Jesus. We're on this cross. We're full of pain and suffering because we deserve, because we deserve it. I put my hope and trust in something I should have never done. And so it's a consequence of something I did. You can't spend all our lives blaming everybody else and complaining about everybody else and grieving, uh, uttering grievances about everybody else, right? We can't do that. Because the key to deliverance and getting honor from God is forgiveness. It's the key to it all. It's the key. You have to forgive. No matter how bad the offense, right? You have to be able to see the poverty of the person who offended you. You have to be able to put God in it and see how God was working it all for, as we were saying earlier, no matter how evil something may seem to us that happened to us, somehow everything that happened, God did for a necessity to teach us something or to bring us to a place where we would put our hope and trust in God and not put our hope and trust in men. Remember, why do we get bitter, embittered anyway? Because we set our hope, and the hope was overthrown. It was disillusioned. Our expectation was over, overthrown. It didn't turn out the way we wanted, or the way we hoped, or the way we think it should have. We weren't treated the way we thought. So the, the hope, disappointed hope, gave way to disillusionment, which gave way to bitterness. Well, that's why we got to set our hope in God. What are you hoping for? Are you hoping for the smooth ride? My, when I get all bent out of shape and embittered, it's because I, I thought everything was going to go smooth today. I thought I was going to go to this job and A, B, C, and, I, and then when I got there, this circumstance changed the whole job. And it just put a monkey wrench in there. And it took me way longer than I thought. And then this happened. Then then that happened. Well, what was I expecting, right? What am I expecting? Remember, God, if we're being saved, God's putting us in an exercise of overcoming. Well, if there's nothing to overcome, right? So he's going to put things in your path that are not like you thought, not like you expected. You're going to have to overcome it. You're going to have to work around it. You think God doesn't know about working around things? God who put all of this in the scripture and God who declared his word that this is the way everything's going to happen in my creation and he's got all the wills of men and all the deeds and actions of men opposing the way he said it's going to come to pass. So God's got to work around it all and make it come to pass just the way he said it's going to come to pass in spite of all man's opposition to him making it come to pass the way he said. You know, I mean, that's why all the, all the while we've always been taught We've always been exhorted. Don't fight the new world order. You know, don't, don't fight what's coming on the face of the earth in the end of the age. It's written. It's prophesied. You're not going to circumvent the new world order. It's written. It has to come to pass. So we have to worry. We have to apply ourselves to be ready for going through all of this stuff. But you know, I mean, some people actually think, well, if we get together and if we do this and if we do that, we can, we can stop the new world order. We can make America great again. No, none of that's going to happen. You can't circumvent what God said is going to happen anyway. All right. Psychology, quote, manufactures victims who ultimately de become dependent. You become more and more dependent on others try to uh, nurture your wounds and heal you slightly all the time. Coddle you. C try to cater to your wound. No, we don't need our wounds catered to. Okay, We need our wounds healed. And our wounds get healed is when we give up the bitterness because we forgive because the knowledge of God shows us a different perspective than the one we've been holding. And it breaks our bond to sin. Breaks our bond with iniquity. And we become bonded to Jesus Christ, to his charity. Charity, the bond of perfection. perfection. Two bonds, right? Gall of bitterness, bond of iniquity. Charity, bond of perfectness, perfection. 
Okay, and it's another quote, for psychologists to claim to know the mystery of human consciousness is a colossal and dangerous hubris. And that word hubris just means it's a proud and arrogant presumption for psychology to think they can delve and know what's going on in the conscience of man or in the soul of man. They do not know. And another quote, we've had a hundred years of psychotherapy and the world is getting worse. <laughs> And now I've got some names here. A guy named Paul Witz. He wrote a book called Psychology as Religion. He was saying psychology, people use it like a religion. He says, contemporary psychology amounts to little more than the worship of self. Mm -hmm. You see what all this so-called psychological therapy does? Gets you to dwell on your wounds. Dwell on your traumas. Mm -hmm. Dwell on yourself. Dwell on yourself. Dwell on yourself. It genders to selfishness. It genders to reinforcing the idea you're a victim. And we cannot cultivate that feeling like we're a victim. Yeah, we've had things happen to us, wrongdoings, and if you want to look at things like that. But are we really the victims when we have at our disposal all the power of God, all the knowledge of God, all the, you know, is there a bomb in Gilead? Is there? Yeah. Let it rather be healed. My soul runs in the night. My soul refused to be comforted. Refused. Yeah, we cannot stay in that state. Okay, if, if you go through a real tough trial and, and you're like that for a certain period of time, all right, okay. That happens. But we can't stay there. And David says, Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I'm so troubled I cannot speak. I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart. My spirit made diligent search. Now, this is David. He's, in, he's troubled. He's so troubled he can't even speak. He refuses to be comforted. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will it be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Well, I can add something to that, and I'm not adding to the word of God. Right? I could say, does it only seem like only the evildoers seem like they're vindicated, Lord? Like Jeremiah said, Lord, I know you're a righteous God and everything, but I uh, let me talk to you about your judgments. How come the way of the wicked prospers? How long, Lord, do we ever get vindicated? You know, other men seemingly get vindicated while they're carrying on in their evils. And they want to be vindicated. And, well, I want to be vindicated. There's things that I know are Christ in me. And I would like that, them to be vindicated. How long? You know, it, you know, how about it, God? Why, where, why is this? Why are we in the status quo? Why do we go so long, so long, and it seems like we're not vindicated? You know, what did Isaiah said uh, when, when we feel like our judgment has passed from the Lord? Like the judgment of God that should come to vindicate us somehow isn't coming. It seems like we're not being vindicated. We're not being... Uh, justified for those things that are Christ in us. I'm not saying for those things that are not Christ in us. But is this mercy clean gone? Does this promise fail forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercy seal up? And I said, this is my infirmity. David said, this is my infirmity. This is a weakness of faith. He finally recognizes, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I'll remember God's acts of grace. I'll remember the times that He did eventually take me, uh, bring me through, vindicate me, heal me, you know, show, show the things that I did were, were, in fact, works that were wrought in God. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Yeah, it's okay to want to be vindicated, but we just can't vindicate ourselves. I will remember the works of the Lord, surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate of all thy work and talk of all thy doings. Christopher Latch, the culture of narcissism. And narcissism is basically love of self, preoccupied with self. The mission of post-Freudian, you know, Sigmund Freud, as they call him, the father of psychology. Yeah. And that psychology has always only been around in this form now for, what, about a hundred and something years, since the turn of 1900s. Okay. The mission of post-Freudian therapies, psychology therapies based on Freud's ideas, is the gratification of every impulse. 
Well, I'm sorry. I think Freud was a pervert. <laughs> you know, it seems like everything to him related back to sex and stuff. And of course, I may be premature with that, but I, that's the sense I get from Freud. Psychology's sanction for selfishness. Quote, the popular psychological theories that emerged after Freud are rooted in the assumption that occupying and serving yourself or egoism is the sole functional ethical principle. Means the sole thing is for you to be happy, gratify yourself, serve, serve yourself, be preoccupied with yourself. You know, there's a, there's a uh, proverb that says, a fool's heart hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. So you were lost, but now you found you. Is that, is that what we're saying? That's, that's by and large what psychology is trying to accomplish. No, I once was lost and he found me. I can't find myself. But that's by and large what psychology is. And what it does, it's like I say, I, I went through all of that just to... Uh, Reinforce the idea of resentment, relive, occupying self in its feelings of wounds and rejections and betrayals, uh, feeling justified in casting yourself as a victim, therefore I have a right to do all these ungodly things. Remember blind Bartimaeus had to put that garment, he had to cast that garment away. And like I say, I, I don't want to belittle any trauma because people do go through trauma. People get sexually abused and it's horrible and it really affects people. You know, people who are sexually traumatized, especially younger people, they don't know how to cope with it. They, they come to a certain extent, I would almost like to say they're victims and they, they, they go on, they, they can't handle it, they try to commit suicide and it really, sexual sins like that really mess people up. But now, we as Christians, as we grow up and we get more mature, here's, here's what we're after. We don't want to consider ourselves victims. Okay, now if you're some little kid who got sexually molested, I'm not saying this, I'm not requiring this of you. You're just a little kid or maybe you're just a very, very young sheep in the, in the Lord and you haven't had a chance to be rooted and grounded in love. Okay, but what I'm saying is, Eventually, we have to not cast ourselves as the victim so that we can let go of these things and forgive. Yeah. Because if we don't forgive, it'll eat us up. And believe me, I've known enough bitterness to know, and I'm still in it to varying degrees, that I, it, it'll eat you up. Bitterness won't destroy the person that offended you. Bitterness will destroy you. It's like a cancer. It'll consume you and eat you from the inside out. And that's what it means, you know, the plague of leprosy, it frets inward. The, the, the gall of bitterness, it turns inward, it festers, it, we can't dwell upon it. So there is a, there is a, a prerequisite for forgiveness. Just before I do that, a lot of the time the things that plague us, like I said, are wounds and things that have been scarred over so that it does not appear at extremely evident or outward maybe that we're, we have wounds or bitterness and yet they're, they're deep in there. They're somehow buried beneath cloaks and scar tissue, with what have you. The, the account of the devil with the dumb, the dumb spirit in Mark 9, verses 17 to 29. Master, I brought unto thee my son which hath the dumb spirit. And wherever he taketh him, he tears him, he foams, he gnashes with his teeth and he pineth away. That sounds like somebody in bitterness, gnashing, grieving, bitter, and it's just it's consuming you and you're pining away. I asked your disciples to cast them out and they could not. O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bring, suffer you? Bring him to me. They brought on to him and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. The reason I'm saying that is because, believe it or not, we go, we're going to go through things, uh, issues of deliverance, revelations of wounds that are in our heart, foundations that iniquity has laid in us, a foundation in us built on 
bitterness and things that will be uh, traceable to experiences that we experienced in our childhood. Or they'll be traceable back to experiences that we happened a long time ago. Fears and all sorts of things. Yeah, I still remember, I can still remember certain things that happened to me as a young, very young, young man. I don't know if they still have a hold of me or, or not. I'll just put myself forth as an example, okay? When I was like four or five years old, my friends were teasing me and they all ran around and they all grabbed me like they were going to drag me off somewhere. And their only intent was just to kind of have fun, scare me a little bit and let me go. And I had a rock in my hand. Uh-oh. And I panicked, and I threw the rock. And it was a fairly big rock, and it hit the guy right in the forehead, put a big gash on his forehead, and the whole thing crushed me because I did not want to hurt anybody. But I was in a panic, and and I just reacted to it. So here I was, scared that they were going to do something to me. Now I had to deal with the the guilt that I had hurt my friend, finding out afterwards that they weren't really serious about it, and it, it traumatized me. Well, now that could be something that the devil can build upon. Make you f- full of fear or full of bitterness or w- what have you. I'm just saying. I, I knew another episode where we we're a basketball team and uh, they, they picked out this one individual and they said, Hey, hey, Bobby, go ask Grant over there how his mother dances. But we're coming home from a basketball tournament. We're go- coming home from a basketball tournament. And we have the junior basketball team and the senior basketball team on, and both in the same bus. And this is a prank that they're playing. It's, it's all for fun, they think. It's all for fun. So they ask Bobby, go ask Grant how his mother dances. And Bobby says, that doesn't make any sense. What do you mean? Why would I ask how his mother dances? I don't understand. Ah, just, 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 go, just ask him. Just ask him. Never mind. Just. And they pressed him and pressed him and pressed him until he went, okay, Grant, how does your mother dance? And then, of course, this is all already pre rehearsed, but Grant flies up out of the seat and tries to beat Bobby up, and about five guys hold Grant back, and one of them says, didn't you know that Grant had, Grant's mother had both her legs cut off in a car accident? Huh. Bobby was, was told to ask him, how does your mother dance? See, so, so then Bobby has to deal with the guilt causing trauma on Grant because he opened up apparently this wound in Grant that his mother had no legs. You know, like what a taunt, right? But Bobby didn't mean to do anything. He was just responding to the people who were egging him on to do it. But it's all a setup. Grant's mother never had her legs cut off in a car accident. So then afterwards, everybody's laughing and laughing about how, you know, how vulnerable Bobby was, how they got him, they got him. But poor old Bobby was just crying away. It just traumatized the guy. So... That, that can be, uh, just, what happened to you in your childhood? What things happened to you? What things happened to you in your past? This is what I'm saying. We have a, a real bondage here. How long ago is it since this came out to him? And he says, of a child. And it cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And the father of the child cries out, says with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Jesus sees the people come running together. He rebukes the foul spirit and says, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, come out of him, enter no more into him. And then, so it comes out of him and they say, why couldn't not we cast him out? He said, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Because it is a very deep, layered issue of bondage and whatever bitterness or rejection or traumatic experience and it has to be sometimes it needs prayer and fasting the strongholds the devil gets strongholds on people sometimes all right so resentment is we don't want to say we want to eventually come to the point where we're not victims but like like i said there is a prerequisite to forgiveness well, let's read one scripture here in the Philippians. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. All right, so here is 
the prerequisite to our forgiveness. It's when we come to the state. And you've heard me say this before. Second Chronicles 6, starting verse 28. If there be dearth in the land, this is Solomon dedicating the temple, okay? There be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars. If their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in this house then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place forgive and render unto every man according to all his ways whose heart thou knowest for thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways so long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers if you know your own sore and your own grief then I reckon that's the only way you'll you'll ever be able to say with King David against thee, against thee only, have I sinned. This is between, you know, the forgiveness thing is between me and God. It's between you and God. That's the key to all deliverance. When you forgive, you don't relive anymore. You let go. You're blind Bartimaeus. You cast away your garment. You, You are no longer... Um, cult, culturing your feeling like you're a victim because you you put God in it you know we have all the things God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that calls us to glory and virtue so we have the knowledge don't we so what we're doing is we're weeding the garden again <laughs> trying to pluck up all the weeds of uh, feeling like we're victims and so on and so forth not not so that we can't have compassion altogether, have no compassion on your wounds or anything, but, but that, so that we ourselves do not cultivate and dwell on it and uh, strengthen our bond with iniquity. This man has done nothing, the thief on the right said. We're on this cross because, yeah, we, we took a wrong turn somewhere down when I was 28 years old. I took the wrong turn. I knew better, I should have done this, and I did that, you know, what have you. I used to, used to talk about, uh, I was like the, a hypothetical story of a man who tells his daughter, don't hang out with that crowd. Don't Tells his daughter, don't hang out with that crowd. They go down to that shady old bar, and they get drink, drinking and smoking dope, and they all kinds of evil things happen. And so the girl doesn't listen to her dad, and maybe a couple of years later, she's at the bar, and some guy rapes her. She's crying foul. I'm the victim. He raped me. And yeah, he raped you. But what happened three years ago? What happened three years ago when Dad says, "Don't go, don't go out, don't go hanging out with those people." See what I mean? And that's the, a lot of the way it is with us sometimes. Somehow, yeah, something that, that did happen to us. And again, I'm not trying to make people who somehow may have been victimized or whatever feel guilty. Like you know, for instance, some young person who was sexually molested and had no power because they were overpowered by a more powerful person or a figure of authority. See, I'm not trying to be insensitive to that, but I'm, I'm saying there is a time when you have to realize, we have to realize that we can't cast ourselves as victims because we have to overcome, we have to let things go, we have to allow ourselves to be healed or we'll be forever trapped in a gall of bitterness uh, resentment, reliving our wounds, and bonded to our iniquity. We cannot embrace our wounds, prefer our wounds. We have to let the wound go. It's something to strive towards. I'm not again. I'm not saying it's easy because I mean I still struggle to this day with this kind of stuff. But but that is really a key to deliverance and a key to peace and getting honor from God and being established is, is that let go of the wounds you know let not that which is lame be turned out of the way let it be healed let your wounds be healed believe in the comfort that comes from God seek for God by patient continuance seek for that honor from God the immortality the eternal life the healing the forgiveness you know forgive and you shall be forgiven and on and on you go and that's the key to all our deliverance is going to be on those fundamental levels.
All right. God bless you.